So thank you uh, folks for uh, uh, just being with, with me today in class. The Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, today, uh, I want to look at just a few of her images throughout the years, tell some of her stories, how she's been understood in various cultures. While each image attempts to say something about her, the images, just like the stories that accompany them, mirror the internal life, the dilemmas and dramas, the beauty and the pain, what they say not only about her, but what they say about us. So although she's become a Christian icon, you'll see that the image of Mary speaks cross-culturally, even taking on and adopting characteristics of other traditions. We want to look beyond the superstition, beyond the surface of Christian doctrine, to see the deeply human in her images. And I want to say thank you to Emmy Hurley for this beautiful wood, wood uh, uh, painting of Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she gifted to me just uh, a few days ago. So Emmy, I want to acknowledge you and say thank you. Just one example, though, before we begin, she's called Virgin Mary, yet virgin was more of a social designation than a biological one. I used to spend an entire class about talking about virginity as a social construct in the Christianity section of my religion and women class. Vir virginity as a commodity, patriarchal ownership of a woman's body. That's why the feminist movement has always been a threat to so many evangelical Christians. But what's lesser known is that there were, really, we, we don't, we're not taught this much in churches. There were disputes in the early church about the term virgin. Some bishops used the term as in Rome, like the Vestal Virgins, right? The, the cult of uh, Vesta, the goddess of the hearth. And they had to remain sexually pure for their lives. But for others, a minority of bishops, it meant independent, a woman who didn't belong to a man. She belonged to herself. We would say a woman with agency who made her own decisions. There were married and widowed women accepted into religious orders in the early and medieval church who were classified as virgins. They were called virgin widows, for example. But of course, we know which side in the church won. Interpreting the tradition through metaphor and myth opens up the worlds of meaning and unlocks, if we let it, the deepest part of ourselves. That's why I like to say the problem isn't that people are too religious. The problem is that they aren't religious enough. Religion, at least Christmas religion, is not so much about understanding, it's about incarnating. So some images now of beautiful virgin, blessed queen, wild revolutionary, passionate advocate, mother, Mary. Carl Jung describes mother as archetype. This is mother love, one of the most moving and unforgettable memories of our lives. The mysterious root of all growth and change the love that means homecoming, shelter, the long silence from which everything begins and into which everything ends. And this from the Lebanese American philosopher poet Khalil Gibran. I'll let you read it, I'll just highlight. The most beautiful word on the lips of mankind is mother. She's everything, our consolation and sorrow, hope and misery, strength and weakness, source of love, mercy, sympathy, forgiveness. Everything in nature bespeaks mother. The sun gives it gives the earth nourishment of heart. 
leaves the universe at night until it's put the earth to sleep to the song of the sea and hymn of the birds and brooks. And this earth is mother of trees and flowers, produces them, nurses them, weans them. The trees and flowers become kind mothers of their great fruits and seeds. The mother is the prototype of all existence, eternal spirit, full of beauty and love. Khalil uh, Gibran, uh, these are his paintings too, as you can see, of his mother. But let's go back even to pre-Christian times. You remember that I showed you this image about three years ago on a Tuesday morning. <coughs> we see the collective unconscious archetype of mother in the oldest, this is the oldest undisputed known figure of a human being. She's called the Earth Mother of Holofels from 42,000 years ago, uh, BCE. She's the oldest of some 200 of these female figurines found in, uh, during the Upper Paleolithic period, the Late Stone Age, between 50,000 and 12,000 BCE. She sculpted from a woolly mammoth tusk. It was found in the German Alps, just north of the border with Switzerland. She's two and a half, uh, she's two and a half inches in height and has been pieced together from six fragments that were found 10 feet underground. You can oh. see she has, she has prominent breasts, two short arms, and a number of deeply etched creases across her torso. Her pubic triangle is well outlined and they have, and the slits in her pubic triangle have traces of red ochre. This was a talisman. Her buttocks and genitals are exaggerated, but her legs are stumpy and pointed, and she's headless. In its place, a carved ring between her shoulders suggested that she was worn as an amulet or a pendant. All these features suggest. She's associated with fertility, menstruation, childbearing, and the feeding and nurturing of children. So the goddess, Earth Mother, in this early period is not simply the female version of the gods. It's not like god and goddess. These mother goddesses symbolize ultimate reality out of which everything comes. Men and women, gods and goddesses both, come out of the Earth Mother. Symbols like the Earth Mother of Holofels symbolize the all, the cosmos. This is what ultimate truth looks like to the earliest people in the human species. For human beings 40,000 to about 12,000 years ago, this, she is the word made flesh. So here are some of the other uh, uh, goddess figurines from the Upper Paleolithic period. So uh, to the Bible, to the Gospels. The Magnificat of Mary has been viewed as dangerous by people in power. Some countries like Guatemala, Argentina, Nicaragua, Philippines, Russia, and others have banned it from being recited in liturgies or in public. Oscar Romero, priest and martyr, drew a comparison between Mary and the poor and powerless people in his own community. Gustavo Gutierrez, the father of liberation theology, said it showed the preferential love of God for the lowly and abused. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it, quote, the most passionate, wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. Scattered the proud, put down the mighty, exalted the low, filled the hungry, and sent the rich empty away. 
Mike, if I can just interject, I know you know this, but the Quran chapter on Mary quotes the Magnificat almost word for word in translation, at least that I've seen. That's correct. That's right, Terry. Thank you. No, that's absolutely correct. It's such a powerful, powerful uh, hymn. And of course, uh, uh, I included the, the lyrics of Let It Be, not only because it's based on Mary's song, uh, and, and, and not only because uh, it, was, uh, it was written uh, by Paul McCartney during uh, an, ex a, 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 an extremely intense period of working on the, their uh, Beatles White Album when he was visited by his mother in a dream who had died, I think it was 12, 13, 14 years prior. She came uh, to him in a dream and said, it's going to all be all right. Just let it be. And uh, uh, that was the inspiration for this hymn. But it also raises an interesting question. Think about it. What is the it you're supposed to let be? There are two ways to look at the answer. The traditional passive consensual let it be or the active sensual let it be. The first is a submission to the powers. The second overthrows the powers. The first it is status quo, let it be. The second it is justice, let it be. She's just received the word that she will conceive and bear a son. Can you mothers remember when you first found out you were pregnant? You fathers too, when you found out you'd be expecting? And then it all begins, the one in whom the hopes and fears of all the years are met. Your child, every child, even more, before you give birth to anything, a dream, a love, no matter what it is that you're giving birth to, there's first the period of gestation, of waiting. There's going to come a time for action, and you must re be ready. But first the stillness, the pondering, the incubating. Let it Whatever it is to which you'll give birth, let it simply be. What are you about to give birth to? The first known representation of Mary is found in the catacombs of Priscilla in Rome, a fresco of Mary nursing the baby Jesus painted around the time of the persecution of Christians in the late hundreds, early 200s. The nursing mother was meant to uplift the flagging spirits of the perse persecuted Christians who were meeting for worship in the catacombs and to give them hope. The baby sits on the mother's lap, nursing, glancing over his left shoulder uh, also to a man uh, pointing at the star of Bethlehem. He's dressed as a philosopher. That's important. He's a man of reason. And extending over all three is a blossoming tree branch, recalling the words of the Old Testament. The rod of Jesse has blossomed. Jesse, you know, David's father, uh, 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 Jesus, the son of David. The rod of Jesse has blossomed. The, the virgin has brought forth love in the flesh. <clears throat> I love this. Uh, I love this uh, earliest uh, picture, uh, earliest image of Mary. But you know, I can't think of, we're going to get to uh, Madonna's, but I can't think of the mother of Jesus without remembering the most revered desert mother who took her name, Mary, the mother of Mother Mary of Egypt. So let me tell you her story quickly. This is from the second century. 
There once was a monk, Father Zosima by name, who lived in a monastery in Palestine. After having mastered all the spiritual arts there, he traveled across the Jordan, where he believed the severe asceticism of the desert would bring him closer to God. Deep into the desert he went seeking God, when one day, after fasting and praying, he saw from the distance a form approaching him naked, darkened skin burnt by the sun, hair white as fleece. He called out and he heard in reply, forgive my nakedness, Father Zosima, please throw me your cloak. Well, he was shocked that this desert woman knew his name, but believing it was a sign, he did as she asked. Mary was her name. She took the name from the Blessed Virgin. Mary was her name, and she was from Egypt, and she told him her story. At 12, she ran away from home and lived life on the streets, begging, selling her body daily and multiple times daily for food, eventually living her life as a prostitute. Well, to make a long story short, after many years, she found herself in Jerusalem at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where she had an ecstatic vision at the foot of an icon of the Mother of God that set her free, whereupon she set out into the desert to purify herself, body and soul. For 47 years, she wandered alone, living off what she could find to eat in the desert, living as austere a life as possible. And that's when Father Zosima found her. She asked him to return in one year to bring her communion, which he did. And then she, he did again a year later. And then a third year, but when he returned that year, he found her dead. Every April 4th during Orthodox Lent, she's remembered by the faithful as a patroness of Black African women a patroness that symbolizes personal transformation is possible. She's, she's remembered for her perseverance. She once told Zosima, who asked her how she'd made it in the desert so long, she said the first 17 years were the hardest. And she's also a patroness, too, for those who struggle with addictions, especially sexual addictions. I love St. Mary, Mother Mary uh, of Egypt. She's my favorite. Really, of all the desert mothers and fathers, she is my favorite, along with Abba Makarios, the desert father. Well, during the Holocaust, while living in southern France, Marc Chagall, a Jew, painted many Christian religious scenes. In 1938, White Crucifixion. But he also began Madonna of the Village, which he wouldn't complete until four years later, having fled from the Nazis to New York. Mary his, is played, is pictured as his wife, Bella, holding a little girl, their daughter, Ida. And Chagall is there too. You can see him reaching down from the uh, top of the uh, painting, kissing the Madonna, his wife, from above. She's dressed in bridal gown white, floating above the village of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, but it's really his native village, Vitebsk, in Belarus, six hours east of Moscow. The village is darkened. The old city was destroyed. Most of the local Jews killed by the Nazis in the 1941 Vydepsk ghetto massacre. Yet it's illumined with one candle, the Madonna's light. She's the female savior. How could a Jew paint this? Well, for him, the Madonna symbolized it would be the Jewish women who would keep Jewish faith, culture, and the traditions alive after the Holocaust. She becomes a symbol 
for the Jewish women, the strong, persevering Jewish women of the village. The rest of the painting adorns her. Chagall's own transfigured nativity scene, blue sky, two angels, one in blue with arms folded over the chest and one in white playing a bugle. A heavenly lover bringing a bouquet, a cow for Chagall, a symbol of the village, security playing a violin, another angel and another singer. Such rich, deep, beautiful colors. Chagall's Madonna of the village. Terry mentioned the Quran before. <clears throat> and so we can't forget Islamic devotion to Mary. Here's Rumi on Mary. There's a morning where presence comes over you and you sing like a rooster in your earth colored shape. Your heart hears no longer frantic. You begin to dance. At that moment, soul reaches total emptiness. Your heart becomes Mary, miraculously pregnant. And body, like a two-day-old Jesus, says wisdom words. Now the heart turns to light. The body picks up tempo. Where love walks, the footprints are musical notes. And holes you fall through into space. Your heart becomes merry. And your footprints become musical notes. According to tradition, on December the 12th, 1531, on a hill in a desert near Mexico City, a 57-year-old peasant named Juan Diego had a vision of a young woman who told him to build a church on the spot he was standing. When a local bishop he had told about the vision asked him for proof, he said, the lady told him to, quote, bring the roses behind you. And sure enough, behind him, he saw roses growing, which he cut and placed into his poncho. When he later opened up his poncho, instead of roses, there was a picture of the young lady of the vision, the origins of Our Lady of Guadalupe. December the 12th became a national holiday in Mexico in 1859. Pope Pius XXII crowned her Empress of the Americas in 1945, and she's long been the patron saint of Mexico making this brown-skinned Mary not only a religious symbol, but also a cultural one as well, even cross-cultural, adopting traditions and symbols from the polytheistic indigenous population. She's painted with brown skin. She's a mestiza. Her eyes cast down, tender and compassionate. She's carried by a cherub on a pillow, a sign of royalty. Let it be to me, she prays. Her cloak is covered with 46 stars. She stands within a mandorla of the rays of the sun. The black ribbon belt that she can barely see under her folded hands is an Aztec sign of pregnancy. And she's astride a black crescent moon. The name Mexico comes from the Aztec count, compound word mestlichitzitli, which became in Spanish mexico, which means the navel of the moon. She is both ometichutli and ometichuatl, the primordial Aztec divine couple. Union of male sun and female moon energies, heaven and earth, spirit and flesh. She's also the Christmas Mary with child and Mary of the book of Revelation 12.1. 12, 12, Revelation says this, 
a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and she cried out in her pangs of birth in anguish for delivery. She's not merely delivering a child. She's delivering a revolution of values. She's revolutionary Mary, this tender yet wild image. There's more here uh, that I could talk about, but you get the idea. And she's the champion of the Indian, of the poor, the powerless. She's the mother of rights, resistance, revolution. Father Miguel Hidalgo of the Mexican War of Independence from Spain in the early 1800s, as well as Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata in the Mexican Revolution 100 years later in 1910, each carried an image of, the, of Our Lady of Guadalupe into battle with them. And, and Ani, I, I'm, I couldn't help but think of you. In the U.S., her image has been a social justice icon adopted by everyone from Cesar Chavez to, pro, to uh, immigration reform activists to pro-LGBTQI groups. She's the mother of the streets, the isolated, the sojourner, the refugee and immigrant, the oppressed. And you can see then in these Kelly Lattimore icons, uh, she's presented as the lady of uh, f families and the streets, our lady of the journey, the protectress of the oppressed. The image of mother as an uh, 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 um, archetype, gathering together all the needs and desires and concerns of those who call on her for help. Here's another famous Madonna I want to talk about today, and that's Our Lady of Chestakova, the so-called Black Madonna, considered the queen and protectress of Poland. The tradition is that she was brought to Poland. Her icon was brought to Poland in 1384 from Constantinople, where it had been presented to em Emperor Constantine in 384 by his mother, Helena, after her sojourn in Jerusalem. So on the thousandth anniversary, the icon, at least according to the tradition, was brought to Poland from Constantinople. She's the most famous of the so-called Black Madonnas. There are between 400 and 500 of them throughout Europe, many of which in Orthodox churches who are more sensitive to the fact that the historical Mary had darker skin. Syncretism is the merging of images, myths, and ridges, and images among cultures. And such is the image of Mary, the Black Madonna. The Black Madonna made her way to Haiti, brought by Polish soldiers sent by Mandol uh, Napoleon to subdue the Haitians during the revolution in 1791. And she quickly became associated with Isilia Danto, Ioe, the senior spirit within Haitian voodoo. You know, voodoo is a, an African diasporic religion that developed in Haiti between the 16th and 19th centuries between West Africa traditional religion and Roman Catholicism that was transplanted into Haiti. Well, the Black Madonna was brought to Poland, uh, brought to uh, Haiti by Polish soldiers sent by Napoleon. The Black Madonna has just such a rich history. I'm only touching the surface of it. We trace the history of the Black Madonna to pre-Christian times linked to the ancient worship of Mother Earth, you know, the rich, fertile soil. Other goddesses such as Sybil, Artemis, Gaia, and Isis 
Many of them pictured black as well. Black, right? The fertile earth, evoking African roots. Fertility, the mother of all living, the nourisher, the nurturer from whom we all come, to whom we all return when we die. I love these uh, three particular images. The Ephesian Artemis, uh, there's a, a copy of it in the uh, um, museum in Ephesus. Some of us may have seen it there, but the original is in the uh, Museum of Naples. In the Old Testament, we find her in the Solomon Song of Songs. Tradition says that the refrain is associated with the Queen of Sheba. Sheba being the biblical name for modern-day Ethiopia. Oh, that you would kiss me with the kisses of your lips. Your love is more delightful than wine. Oils are fragrant. Your name, sweet perfume. And you scroll down further. I am black and I am beautiful. And so a whole tradition develops around the Black Madonna coming biblically from the Queen of Sheba and her relationship with Solomon. Pope Francis has a special devotion to the Black, Black Madonna. Here's what he has to say in general, not specifically about her, but in general in his uh, latest uh, Evangelii Gaudium, The Joy of the Gospel. We must be bold enough to discover new signs and new symbols, new flesh to embody and communicate the word and different forms of beauty, which are valued in different cultural settings. The Pope believes that the black Madonna can be such a new symbol for the faithful, representing the obligations Christians have to the poor, the duty to create just economic, political, and legal structures. He says, the world can no longer trust in the unforced, unseen forces and the invisible hand of the market. How is it not news when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it's news when the stock market loses two points in his latest encyclical? So these are some of the new forms of the Black Madonna. The two on the left quote from his encyclical. New forms that have empowered uh, the Black Lives movement for which she is a powerful symbol. So I want to return to the Virgin of Guadalupe again. And I'll do it this way. A little known piece of Americana is that in the 1940s and 50s, the founder of Hallmark, Joyce Clyde Hall, enlisted famous artists to design the company's Christmas cards, including Pablo Picasso, uh, Paul Cezanne, Paul Gauguin, Vincent van Gogh, George O'Keefe, and others. And it was in 1959 that it was uh, uh, Salvador Dali's turn. He was paid $15,000 in advance for 10 designs, but his surrealist and disturbing images, his butterfly Christmas tree, three kings astride an agitated camel, and a headless angel playing a lute, all bombed with the public. And so they discontinued Dolly's Christmas card series. <laughs> But in 1959, he also painted his Virgin of Guadalupe, modeled by his wife, Gala, an homage to Raphael's Sistine Madonna from 1514. Uh, even though he was a surrealist, uh, uh, Salvador Dali uh, had a real affection for uh, Raphael and considered him a mentor from four centuries earlier. You notice the child is an exact copy 
of Raphael's child. The Virgin of Guadalupe is clothed in sumptuous color, aquamarines and turquoises and spring greens, the pale pink roses popping up in the middle of the painting. At the bottom, a single jasmine flower in a vase, symbolic of the Virgin's paradoxical combination, right? This is what the jasmine symbolizes, a combination of modesty and sexuality. The jasmine has been a powerful symbol in religious traditions across, across all religions for centuries and centuries. And speaking of Salvador Dali, he had a couple of other nativity scenes. Almost two decades before his Virgin of Guadalupe, Dali dabbled in a couple of nativity paintings. This is Nativity of a New World. It appeared in Esquire magazine in 1942. It presents a wild tableau of figures gathered at an altar. A man with a floppy hat holding a lamb. A black man in spiritual ecstasy. An old man bent over. A cloaked kneeling person in prayer. Music making angels. And they all are before the birth of a child holding up a transparent blue ball emerging from a cave. A new world is born, the name of the painting, Nativity of a New World. There are other Dalian features here too, but that's for another time. I kind of have studied Salvador Dali's art for a while, and this is one of my favorites of his painting, along with the next one. And I, I've been eager to show you this next nativity. So that one was in 1942. The following year, 1943, he painted his geopoliticus child watching the birth of the new man. It shows an egg-shaped globe out of which a man struggles to be born. Dolly painted this during his stay in the U.S., 1940 to 1948. The new man hatches out of the United States, notice, and clutches England in his hand. In the foreground are a fig-leafed, a malnourished adult of indeterminate sex pointing to the birth and a child now just becoming aware, hiding behind the adult in fear. I wonder who the child represents. This is during the war, remember, during World War II. So influenced in 1943, remember, influenced by the Second World War, Geopoliticus child, suggests that out of destruction and hopelessness, the new man, America, is emerging as a major force of the world, major force of hope. And yet, and yet, tempering this hope, tempering the entire scene exhibited by the red stream in the middle of the painting, the cost for this birth will be paid in blood. And with Africa, symbolizing the third world, weeping a single tear. Do you see the tear? So these are Th Salvador Dali's three nativities, the Virgin of Guadalupe, the nativity of a new world and geopoliticus child. These three form kind of a little corpus within the Dali within the Dali uh, corpus of paintings. Okay. Now to Palestine for some images to close, a few of my favorite Madonnas. Celebrated Palestinian artist Nabil Anani painted Mother's Embrace in honor of International Women's Day, March 8th, 2013. She's dressed in a traditional Palestinian thob, a dress, 
that blends into the landscape, she embraces the Dome of the Rock, a symbol of Palestine, like a mother embracing her child. The white of her scarf, the black of her dress, uh, the black of her sleeves, and the red of her dress, all colors of the Palestinian flag. This Palestinian mother, symbolic of family and national honor, the motherland, a producer, transmitter, nurturer, and guardian of culture, the mother. Also a symbol of the land, fertile and beautiful. The centrality of agriculture, the fertile earth, and sacred bond to the land. And in her dress, look at her dress. Allusions to Palestinian values, family and youth, the importance of community, collecting fruit, the responsibility to transmit the traditions, carrying water, the fight for water rights, picking olives, the olive, a symbol of rootedness, the ancient bond of the Palestinians with their homeland. Immediately under her cradled Jerusalem, is a small door that resembles a lock, locks and keys symbolic of the Palestinian right of return. Mother's Embrace. And some of you who have traveled with me have seen the next one. In 1969, the Basilica of the Annunciation was completed in Nazareth the fourth church built on the traditional site of Mary's house. The first church was built as a shrine in the mid fourth century at the same time of Bethlehem's church in the nativity and Jerusalem's church of the Holy Sepulcher, a time of early Christian pilgrimage to the Holy land. And like I say, many of you have been with me here. There's so much I could say about the church. All I'll say now is that the tuppling, that, that the towering cupola and dome is in the shape of an inverted lily, a common symbol for the Madonna. The church features a couple hundred icons, mosaics, and other pieces of art depicting Mary. The American contribution is the only one of them in which Mary is still pregnant. It's the only one. So the child isn't pictured. It's kind of been a controversial one. A lot of people don't like it. I, I love it. According to the sculptor Charles Madden of Pennsylvania, this is both the Mary of Christmas, who sings out the Magnificat while pregnant. Remember, scattering the proud, putting down the mighty, exalting the humble, filling the hungry, sending the rich away empty. But she's also the Mary of the book of Revelation, the woman clothed with the sun, ready to deliver her baby, a new social order based on the reversal of Romans regime values. On the plaque under the sculpture, there's a quote from Gerard Manley Hopkins, famous pope, famous poem, God's Grandeur, where he equates Mary with, quote, the grandeur of God that will flame out like a shine like shine from shook foil. Mother Mary, here like Lady Sophia, Lady Wisdom, she hovers at the dawn of new creation. And notice here, notice here, this lady, this Mary is black. Often goes unnoticed. Quentin, here you are, man, along with some of my other travelers. Our friend Ian Knowles is the founder, iconographer, and teacher at the Bethlehem Icon Center. It's up on Star Street, just about a five-minute walk from Manger, from Manger Square. And it's sponsored by the Greek Melkite Catholic Church, whose bishop blesses each icon written there with an olive branch dipped in olive oil. Ian's Our Lady of Palestine holds a place of honor as you enter the center, and the original is in the Latin Patriarchate Cathedral in Jerusalem, just up the block from the Gloria Hotel where we all stay. 
Mary sheds a tear over symbols of the Holy Land. You can see that the risen Christ is poised right in between uh, 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 Mount Carmel in Haifa in Israel on his right and Mount Nebo in present day Jordan on his left and Jerusalem underneath. This year, our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Christmas card is Ian's Our Lady Who Breaks Down Walls. We just sent it out this past Sunday. Some of you have, may have seen it with me, part of the graffiti on the apartheid wall that Israel built around uh, surrounding, surrounding the little town of Bethlehem. Ian says his inspiration was from Revelation 12. Again, the woman clothed with the sun, giving birth with a cry of pain. And he connected this image with the suffering of Palestinian and other Middle East Christians. He painted it on the apartheid wall surrounding Bethlehem in 2010. But then in 2014, an open mouthed serpent was painted around the corner from her. They call it, by the way, the Bethlehemites called it Sharon, the snake, Ariel Sharon. But Ian said that this even reinforced the image of Mary of Revelation 12, pregnant, clothed with the sun, chased by the beast that wants to devour her child. Of course, the serpent in Revelation is Rome. And today, all colonial regimes of oppression, like Israel, like the U.S., and like others. Just like the previous Madonna and Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin of Christmas and Revelation, they're all one. By the way, as an aside, later in Revelation 12, it reads, the woman was given the wings of a great eagle that she might escape and fly away from the serpent. So this was our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Peace Christmas card this year, Christmas image. I think maybe some of you got it on Sunday morning, right? You received it in the mail. A contemporary poem asks if Mary breastfed Jesus. Now it might seem trivial, except for that it uncovers a, a deeper, much deeper theological question and a matter of personal devotion, much deeper matter of personal devotion than simply the title. Think about it, and I'll let you read it. This is incarnation, right? Mothers know incarnation. And men, those men who've had mothers, they know incarnation. The problem is, is that incarnation means revolution. And we are afraid of the revolution that incarnation brings. We've always been afraid of the flesh. And what Christmas means, what incarnation means, is that the flesh, as well as the spirit, uh, is holy. And so that's why I want to close with a couple of my very favorite images. 
the Magnificat according to the Gospel of James. By the way, this is where we get these stories, right, of Mary's parents, Anne and Joachim, and the Immaculate Conception, the idea of, that Mary was immaculately conceived. Written in the last half of the second century is the Gospel of James. An infancy, an infancy narrative, one of the Gnostic, one of the Gnostic Gospels. An infancy narrative about Jesus that elevates his mother with stories about her immaculate conception, how she was conceived without sin, and her perpetual virginity, that is before, during, and after Jesus' birth. But you know, this is unsurprising. Because in the ancient world, gods and heroes were often depicted as being supernaturally nursed. Horus at the breast of Isis is a very familiar image. And of course, it's the famous story. The founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, after being abandoned by their mother, being nursed by a she-wolf. The wolf, a great image of wildness. So it was in the 12th century when Marian devotion was at its peak in the Western church, there developed a tradition in popular piety about Mary's milk channeling her life force. Her milk equated with the blood of Christ in communion, the personification of Sophia, of wisdom, of the primordial life-creating, life-sustaining energy of mother of Earth Mother. So remember the Earth Mother of Holofels from 42,000 years ago? This is the Earth Mother in the Western Church of 800 years ago. This is Word Made Flesh as well. Two of the most famous paintings from the 12th century, the first in one of Rome's oldest churches. Those of you who've been to Rome may have seen this. It's really one of the oldest churches in Rome the Basilica of Our Lady of Trestevere, first built in the second century. It's present structure from the 12th century. And the second, this wonderful, wonderful image of the lactation of St. Bernard. Again, if we don't take these literally, but if we take them as, as, as myth, as metaphor, what do they tell us about ourselves? And, of course, maybe some of you have been there with me here, too. Just up the road from the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is one of my favorite chapels in all the Holy Land, which I make a point to visit on every trip, the Milk Grotto of Our Lady. The present chapel, built in 1872, is on the site of the 5th century church where tradition says that as she breastfed Jesus, a drop of milk spilled onto the floor, changing the color of the entire cave to milk white. Because of this, cave stones made of calcium carbonate were considered a relic in the first centuries because when diluted in water, they take on the appearance of milk. So the Madonna is Mary. Teenage Palestinian mother, true. But she's also what it means to be woman. Woman with a capital W. Indeed, what it means to be deeply, fully, freely, wildly woman. And human. And human. The best of our species. And even more. And even more. Bigger. Larger the truth of the planet, the universe itself, Mother Earth and beyond. She is many things, this Madonna, this woman, but she is first and foremost, as we've seen, she's been many things in many cultures and in many traditions, but first and foremost, she is bearer, caregiver, nurturer, protector, healer, the one who sets her children free, because in the end, 
for Mother Mary, for Mother Mary, it's all about her children, the children, all children. And so it is for us.
fire.